Orchestration. This is a class I co-taught in the fall of 2008 with Josh Emig, who's Auburn stole him away from New York, so I'm kind of upset about that, but it's okay. I won't hold grudges. Um, uh, but we uh, co-taught this class and wrote up a brief, and the, the idea was to get students to not, well, it's to kind of um, argue with the idea that these digital tools bring us closer to the master builder or back to the master builder. Um, we uh, kind of, we wanted to, say that these tools uh, made us more a master collaborator or um, orchestra, you know, a composer of an orchestra, someone that really has to speak enough languages at a certain level that you could really kind of uh, lead the conversation, or uh, uh, lead's not the right word, but you could kind of promote conversation and, and get the most out of the project. So <coughs> one of the things we were able to do was get some consultants uh, early on for the uh, for the teams. Uh, we broke the students up into teams. Uh, so we had Front uh, help them out. It was pretty quick, and they, they went in for a Saturday and had their projects reviewed all by Mike Roth. Uh, we connected them with um, full-scale panel fabricators out in Long Island. Another thing we were trying to tackle was full-scale fabrication in New York City. It's kind of hard. <laughs> um, so getting them to leave Manhattan. You know, and realizing that it doesn't all have to be done in the fabrication shop of your school. We actually didn't really want them using the fabrication shop in the school. Uh, then uh, connecting them with Maloya Laser, who we knew from our time at working at shop. They had done the uh, brain screen for the porterhouse and were really great to work with. So the students got connected with Maloya. And then Autodesk helped us out quite a bit from giving us some funding uh, for the students, which I thought it was critical that they have a budget. Um, it really didn't matter what the number was because the fabricators helped a lot in terms of doing things for basically cost. But they were working to a number. They got a proposal from the fabricators. They had to think about it. Uh, and then Autodesk also helped out with um, some support and having some uh, technical specialists come in and teach them things. So the structure for the class was to get them to work in teams. Uh, I figured if we're going to try to do something that's like practice, you know, uh, Let's immediately break that, get them to work in groups like, like you do on a project team within an office. And then the next thing was to somehow or another skip the design origination phase. Uh, I didn't want them to spend the whole semester coming up with a design. Um, and so I asked them to pick an existing architectural project as a launching point. It didn't have to look anything like it, but I didn't want them coming up with concepts and things like that. And then none of them looked like them, which is what I was happy about, but I had them start somewhere. And then I had them uh, build it in whatever software they knew. Get comfortable, establish a scale uh, of the size of the project you want to work at, and, and build it. Then start to break it down into component parts, something that was manageable, buildable, uh, repeatable, uh, that they could work with a fabricator on. Then I had them take it out of the computer. I thought that was critical. Uh, I didn't want them doing full-scale prototypes in at the school. I didn't want them using the CNC machine or the water jet. Um, the whole point was to learn how to communicate the design intent to someone that really knows how to use those machines. Um, I think those classes are incredibly valuable, and a lot of the students had taken those, but that, that wasn't the point of this class. Uh, then I had them, or I asked them, I didn't have anyone do anything, but to take their designs to a more rigorous modeling environment. But really, I wanted them to get the resistance of a more fabrication-oriented tool. So here, using feature-based modeling uh, and starting to use some of the techniques uh, available there to realize the design. Then uh, rationalization. And this came through an exchange with the fabricators. This was one of the most exciting parts. This design uh, originally was a custom extruded mullion that was going to be CNC bent and all sorts of fancy things. They just weren't real. Since they had to build this thing, it became flat stock that was bent very simply and had pretty much the same exact, like there wasn't any loss in design intent, but it was buildable. Uh, so the, this is a, you don't have to read this email. I can sum it up for you. But it's on the left, it's 
hi Rado, here's our 3D model, here's our drawing set that we put together all these fancy things for you. And then uh, over on the right, thanks Chris, looks good. Here's a list of all the things you shouldn't do when you're sending stuff to a fabricator. You know, um, and he gives him very kind of good feedback on interacting and conveying your design to someone else that's going to build it because you're not going to build it. But you're going to work together to build it. And I mean, we were lucky in that Rado was very excited about the process and really engaged the students and had them come uh, into his his shop in uh, Long Island. So this is one of the drawbacks of trying to do it in New York City is that we didn't have a lot of space. This is kind of the workshop. It's a corner and studio. Uh, and trying to wiggle it in where you could. The, the benefit was that they had incredibly well-crafted parts, that they were all cut by a fabricator, all cleaned up. Um, you know, they weren't having to deal with uh, milling bits and things like that, but they did all go to, go to the shop and get that feedback and learn how the machinery worked. And Rado gave them feedback. You know, the machine's not going to be able to do this. You can't bend that that way because it's going to break. So in their designs, they can incorporate you know, some of the, the feedback from working with these technologies. So here you can see just some of the, the kind of cleanliness and refinement uh, of the parts that they were working with. Um, then their full scale mock-up, somehow they took over the front lawn of the school. I had kind of nothing to do with that for the end of the year show, but um, it worked out well. Uh, and this part, even though it may not be the most elegant, I, I like to talk about the story behind it. The original design was this, uh, solid steel piece that was going to be CNC milled and this whole extraction process. And through a conversation with Rado, who's just an absolute expert in flat stock, because uh, he works with sheet metal, he came up with a technique, or they came up together, I shouldn't say he came up, but that was the whole point, it was the collaboration with the fabricator, uh, of a way to create something that had a pretty similar look, at, at least scale, but it was all made out of flat stock, so they would fold it, uh, then they would put a bolt through it and get all the connections to work through this notching system. And that was just through his experience with the materials, he was able to help them kind of work through that. And then the tools had something to do with it also, all the sheet metal and bending uh, functionality that they had out of Inventor. So that was their final result. And actually these, they wanted CNC bent and he pushed them to just hand bend them. If they made it out of a thin enough metal, they could get the same effect through hand bending it. Uh, in this case, uh, this group wanted to work with, um, I asked them all to have a fabrication strategy early on, and they wanted to punch metal, to, like car fenders, to get this sense of depth. Uh, and it was just not practical and not realistic. So through working with Rado, they came up with this really nice and refined pinning system uh, where they would just cut a thicker material and kind of cut two sheets and put these pins in there, kind of twist it a couple ways, and it all locked nicely together. And um, I can confidently say they would have never come up with that by themselves. Uh, it was through working with Rado and just some of the things he had done through working with architects and some, you know, just his knowledge, his 30, 40 years of being a fabricator, um, he was able to work with them. And this was their, their project that they put together. And they did it at a third scale because they, they needed the repetition so they didn't get the full scale. Um, but they were able to get it. And you know, part of this, just to talk a little bit about some of the other things we're, we try to do, is um, we foster the conversation through design reform, the website I started when I was a student at Columbia. And uh, now I just post video tutorials and techniques, just make the, t the techniques a non-issue, put them out there so they can learn them. But this is where that becomes quite exciting. Someone will post something very non-trivial, like how do I model the Beijing Stadium? and uh, uh, not an easy task, but <laughs> I'll, I'll take a really sloppy shot, shot at it because it's just kind of fun and, you know, this is how maybe very quickly I would, I would give it a shot. But then this is where it's exciting is that the community posts responses like, like exponentially better than mine. Uh, so someone did it in Revit, which I didn't think was possible. Uh, then someone did a way better version in 3D Max. Then the same person did it in Revit again because he didn't like the way the first one came out, uh, and he, wa he wanted to get the different depths of structure. And then this is a first-year architecture student in China who took a shot. So here, I mean, it's the process, right? It's the end goal. The tool doesn't really matter. Uh, and they were able to have a long conversation uh, about it. So just to talk a little bit to the kind of global community of, of dorks interested in uh, <laughs> design technology, including myself, 
You know, this is some of the Google Analytics from, it's old, this is from a year ago now, from uh, when Erlene asked us to speak at uh, the AIA talk, but I've got people coming from all over the world to watch Revit, Rhino, Grasshopper videos. The, the software doesn't really matter. They're interested in, in the conversation and kind of the, the exchange.